hello everyone uh, welcome back to another event of aquatic and uh, fishery science talks and this is a first talk number uh, 47 uh, let me introduce who we are. Uh, I'm Sajina. I work as senior scientist at uh, ICRC Free Barakpur, Kolkata. Obviously, today I am hosting this webinar. With me on board is uh, Dr. Deepak Jod, who is a fishery scientist based at Australia. Deepak is managing the webinar. So if you have any uh, issue with logging in or in a mic, audio, uh, please let him know. The two other board members of AFS Talks are Dr. Pradesh, who is working as assistant professor in Texas State University, USA, and Dr. Mukta, who is a senior scientist at ICRC MFRI. A little bit of uh, introduction for those who are new to AFS Talks. AFS Talks is an ongoing biweekly webinar uh, series inviting speakers around the world to share information and developments in the area of aquatic science in general. Our aim is to link students, professionals, and researchers to open channels of communication, develop collaboration, and develop a skilled work workforce for the course of providing meaningful science to humanity. So this pl uh, platform is open to everyone who loves hearing a science talk and also who loves giving a science talk. The backbone of AFS uh, talk is the incredible team of coordinators from various institutions where they circulate our upcoming talks to the team, uh, to all the potential interested people. If any of you are interested to be part of our team, just get in touch with any of our board members. Uh, the upcoming talks are announced in our social media platforms and the links are available uh, in our website, www.afstalks.org. Now, the rules for the webinar. Our webinars are free to attend, but you would need a profile name for your Zoom account to let you in. Please not, we don't issue any e-certificates for attending this webinar. Please uh, keep your mic turned off all the time unless the host requests you to turn on, uh, turn on and speak. If you have any questions, uh, please, uh, during the talk, post them to everyone in the chat box or please raise your hand. Questions in the chat box would help the speaker and the audience to understand what you uh, are asking, but you, it will be give, you will be given a chance to uh, ask the question to the speaker after the talk. The speaker has 45 minutes for the talk and 15 minutes for interacting with the audience. No rules for the webcam, but if, it will be nice to see you on stage while asking questions to the speaker. And now let me introduce the speaker of the day. Welcome uh, Dr. Madhu Viyar, working as principal scientist at ICR Central Institute of Fisheries Technology, Kochi. He completed MFSC from CIFT in 1999 and worked with a consultancy firm related to shrimp hatcheries till 2003 and joined Agriculture Research Service in the same year. He worked till 2010 at Veravel Center of SIFT and then at SIFT headquarters at Kochi. Uh, his PhD work was on the bycatch generated by trawlers along the Gujarat coast and also was involved in projects related to development potential fishing zones with the space application center and employees. Currently, he's working on projects related to fish behavior and development of responsible fishing gears. Today, Dr. Madhu will be talking to us about gear technology for sustainable fisheries. Where does India stand? So, sir, welcome again in the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Sajina, for the introduction. Uh, can I share my presentation? Is it fine? Yeah, you can. Yeah, okay. So thank you. Uh, yeah, for the opportunity and then uh, uh, my talk is basically on uh, uh, how uh, uh, fishing technology uh, can be used for sustainable fishing and also uh, an evaluation of where in fact India stands in this regard uh, in terms of uh, gear related uh, measures for sustainable fishing. So just a basic um, before starting I think I'll just go through the uh, introduction part and I think just to refresh and I think most of you are with a fisheries background and so uh, I thought uh, maybe many of you are out of you know fishing gear technology uh, field so I'll just update a little bit and then go to the the actual you know uh, the talk which relates to the fishing technology or rather the gear related uh, technical measures uh, that India uh, is into. 
so uh, with regard to the production uh, from the the capture fisheries so i'll be mostly dealing with the capture fisheries uh, production uh, and also uh, the domain is mostly in the marine sector uh, because we don't have much of you know work with to get technology in the inland waters uh, so in fact this is a very you know, uh, dr madhu sorry for interrupting uh, are you sharing your uh, slides yet because we can't see anything at the end Yeah, I'm, in fact, I'm sharing. One second. Uh, it's not showing up. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I just need to go to full screen. Full screen. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And sorry for that. In fact, I thought it was uh, you know being shared. Uh, so uh, so this is the I mean title of my talk. I think I have already. I, th I think you have heard me, right? Only the slides were not visible. Uh, yes, we have. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this is basically. Uh, so I, uh, this is in fact uh, like uh, what. Uh, or where we stand in terms of uh, the capture fisheries production and we see that uh, uh, from the 50s there was a you know steep increase in the catches and then maybe sometime in the early 90s uh, uh, it stopped growing in fact or rather it got plateaued from then on so from 1990s to uh, 2020 from for way we have the latest data from fao we see that uh, the catches have never gone beyond 100 million tons except occasionally by sometime in 2019 or so where we we reached very close but then we have never crossed that and this is the trend in fact the similar similarly uh, in case of inland waters we see a slight increase not as big as like what we see in marine catches so this is in like uh, what we uh, see in terms of growth and uh, so i was mentioning like i will just uh, ref refresh uh, our old uh, you know what we have uh, been taught regarding the fishing gears large number of gears are being used uh, and then based on the type of operation uh, how much energy it spends or like how sustainable it is like we have divided divided fishing gears into different uh, you know classifications we have this international standard statistic statistical classification of fishing gears and all those things and then uh, but on a broad you know uh, sense like we can divide it into two which you know uh, consumes a lot of energy the typical is the trawlers and then we have the uh, on the other hand we have the low energy fishing uh, which also is you know low impact so something called live fishing it's called uh, low impact fuel efficient fishing uh, then uh, just you know uh, i was mentioning about the trawlers we have different types of trawling operations uh, the single boat single boat then the bull trawling which is you know again a controversy nowadays and then we have the mid water uh, trawls and the lower side you have a low energy type of fishing uh, mostly the uh, the gill nets the bottom set gill nets then uh, we have the trap traps which is again a very uh, sustainable and low energy fishing method and again uh, coming to traditional methods of fishing we have this uh, light fishing methods uh, then uh, traps bag nets and then uh, pole and line fishing all of them in fact are uh, all of them in fact consume very less energy when compared to trawls and long lining of course uh, yeah it is it, it is a commercial uh, uh, it has been conducted in a commercial scale and then uh, globally if you see there is a lot of you know uh, the global extent of in fact long lining is quite high compared to other any other fishing methods but then if you come to the total catches uh, we see that uh, the bottom trawl uh, they contribute the most so we see around 27 million tons or so is contributed by bottom trawls and interesting here is uh, the percin catches the catches from the percins uh, they are coming down 
and it used to be quite high even compared to the bottom trawls, but then uh, uh, they are coming down. And then we see another important thing is the pelagic trawls. So they were quite low in the before pre 90s and then it is increasing. So the pelagic trawl uh, catches are increasing and same is the case with bottom trawls and persinning is coming down. So we can expect that much of the catch, I mean, uh, which was targeted by persons could have been caught by pelagic trolls. But then this is the general trend, the bottom trolls, pelagic trolls contributing significant a chunk of the total marine captures. And then the, towards the, uh, the lower portion of this, like we find the long line catches. So, but the general trend is, uh, except for the bottom trawl, most of them are going down. And then in case of India, like we could see that uh, from the 2005 onwards, the catches have gone quite high. This is basically due to the extension, like what's happening in both in terms of you know spatial uh, extension and also in terms of uh, other uh, improvement in the capacity. I think we will come uh, to that in the later slides. So again, I mean, compared to other countries, we see that the contribution by trawlers uh, is quite, quite big in case of India. So uh, just to show that how important important trawling is, and also most of my talk would be concentrated on trawls because that is one gear where we have done a lot of studies on uh, gear related technical measures. Again, uh, the, the same thing uh, we see, China of course is there, but then Indonesia also uh, catches more than India, but then the management in Indonesia is quite good compared to India and also Malaysia. Just uh, the recent uh, uh, you know, data from uh, Sofia, which shows that it shows the status of the stocks globally. And with relate to the, the production from the Indian waters, the Indian scenario, uh, we see that uh, the, as I was mentioning, like similar to the global production, our catches are also stagnated. The marine catches have stagnated. Uh, and of the total 5.3 million tons, I think we are catching close to 3.8 or so million tons. And similarly, uh, the inland production, inland production, capture production is also uh, increasing. And uh, coming to the, the vessels, like what we have, um, there's, there is a significant in, increase in the number of uh, mechanized and motorized vessels in the Indian scenario. Uh, we see that uh, the uh, after the total 1 lakh 66,000 or so vessels that we have, 58%, 59% almost are comprised of motorized vessels. And then uh, we have almost 26% of mechanized vessels. So coming to these mechanized vessels, again, uh, you see, 70, 72% of that mechanized vessels are contributed by trawlers. So, uh, in fact, when we say trawlers, uh, we should also consider the amount of you know, uh, energy, the, um, the amount of or the, the, the power with which the, these trawlers operate for catching fish. So, that's a huge impact and coming, uh, I think we will discuss about that. And also, gillnet is also contributing significantly in the mechanized sector, almost 15%. So I was mentioning about uh, the earlier slide, I was mentioning about this uh, technology or in increase in the power of the trawlers. So this is a, uh, this is a recent, sorry, it's a recent paper uh, uh, in 2019, which has come, which shows that uh, over these years, the, the technology creep, what we call it, has, has increased and it is increasing by rate of 2.1 percentage. So that means like if, if we maintain the, the vessels, the number of vessels as such, but still we see that each vessel captures more than the previous year. So this, in fact, is not being taken into account when we when we uh, you know, talk about the effort, effort data. So this is quite important because uh, we see that in particularly in Indian waters and also towards the southern part of India, we see a huge increase in the capacity of vessels, both in terms of uh, the engine power, the size of the vessel, and also the, the gear size. So this is very important, in fact, uh, the technology creep that's happening into the fisheries. And the stock estimates say that we have almost 55 or 56 percentage of stocks uh, which are biologically you know, 
fished, I mean, at sustainable levels. Uh, and uh, more recently, we have another paper which has appeared in ICS, ICS Journal of Marine Sciences, which shows a similar trend. Uh, it shows that we are in, except for a few uh, areas, we are in good you know, uh, state. And then uh, uh, coming to the issue of bycatch. So I was mentioning uh, a little bit about the trawl, uh, uh, the issue of trawls increasing in capacity uh, and the size of the trawl and also the size of the gear. So what we see here is that among, uh, this is the re very recent estimate that we have, the global estimate of bycatch, we see that uh, almost all of them are in fact, uh, the higher, higher percentage of uh, the, the catch is by catch, in fact. So apart from, you know, the shrimp trawls contribute more than 50% of catch, which is by catch. So what is in fact uh, by catch? Uh, we have a general classification because the, uh, most of these papers, in fact, if you see, if you read, they classify by catch to different, you know, uh, different types of by catch. In fact, uh, most of them are complicated also the classification. So this is the most accepted classification of by catch where uh, this is like the fish en encountering or fish entering the, the harvesting system. So in that you have the gross catch. And in this gross catch, you have both the target and bycatch. So target is the valued catch. So one that we are targeting or we, we get a good, uh, good money from that. So that is kept aside. And the other portion is the bycatch, which comprises of discarded uh, or which is often discarded because it has no value. And the other portion is the, the, the incidental catch or the retained catch, which has value for fish meal. So this is in fact the general classification of uh, you know, by catch or what comes into the system. And you can see uh, the typical catch from, this is from the uh, Cochin waters. Uh, you see a multitude of, you know, a lot, lot many fishes starting from eels to uh, everything, shells and everything. So mostly the shells and all they go as uh, discards. And the other portion, uh, which is retained, uh, they are bought back and sold to the uh, the market. I mean, that's the course of fish meal. And in our in our conditions, like most of these bycatch uh, comprises of juveniles, so that is one of the biggest issue, and that is uh, one of the areas that we are working on to to reduce the incidence of these juveniles in the in the net. So this is like uh, where our technical measures comes into picture. So again, you can see the size of squids here, quite, quite, uh, you know, very, very small. If they're allowed to I mean, live for another, maybe three months, they would become adults. So that's the, the whole idea of like, you know, letting them go out and at least live for some more time so that they get an opportunity to breed once. So that's the basic idea of, you know, removing the juveniles from the catches. So these are uh, some of the visuals from our trawler itself. We have a trawler at Cochin, uh, which we uh, use it for our experimental operations. So this is the type of, you know, a lot of jellyfish is also coming in, then uh, the sorted catch, and then uh, finally the discards, mostly uh, the juvenile fishes. And if you see uh, the, the Indian perspective itself, like we can see, this is the latest available information that we have from CMFRA, uh, which shows that uh, the low value bycatch, LVB, has increased from 14% in 2008 to 25% in 2011. That is one fourth is in fact low value. What has been caught in trawlers, one fourth is, by, uh, is of low value, which is used for the, the fish meal production or some other uses other than you know, consumption. So coming to uh, our specific uh, topic, like what are the technical measures uh, in gear technology? So uh, technical measure, in fact, can be, uh, it's a broad set of rules uh, where uh, we or the policymakers say when, where, and how uh, the fishermen would catch fish. And there are a lot of, you know, uh, rules that are set in many countries. And then, but then, uh, this may include the minimum landing sizes, minimum conservation sizes. So now we have this MLS here in India. So CMFRA has bought out uh, the MLS, minimum legal sizes for a lot of uh, fishes along the coast. 
So this is one technical measure which we could use as gear technologies we could use for you know uh, to design our gears. And then we have the specification of uh, for the design and use of gears. We have minimum measure sizes. So all this comes under the technical measures category. This is like in, if, if, you, if you use all of these, in fact, follow all of the above, uh, we have a, a selective gear to reduce unwanted catches. Then closed area seasons, it's not directly related to the gear technology, but then it's again a technical measure which is implemented. So the closed season, you know, it, not much of area, but then season like what we have the monsoon ban and all, it's, you know, it's stringently followed here. And the limitation of bycatch, as such, uh, we have this uh, ETP species, uh, you know, being made illegal. But then we don't have anything of that sort for the bycatch. I mean, for the juveniles. And then also uh, measures to reduce the impact of marine or impact of fishing uh, on the marine ecosystems and environment. That also comes under the purview of the technical measures. So we have, you know. Uh, different designs uh, which you know don't disturb the water so all those comes under the technical measures uh, category so uh, coming to so if you have incorporated all these above factors into a gear so that becomes an ideal gear so an ideal gear uh, could include that it is very specific for a particular species and for the size also so both species and size selective and with negligible direct and indirect impact on the known target organism. That means it will just catch whatever fish we need and just release what we don't want. And definitely it has to give high target rate uh, catches at the most or the lowest possible cost. But then, uh, so uh, it's all there in the CCRF. Uh, but then, uh, if you see the ideal gear, it never exists. We cannot do that. Uh, it's it's just you know uh, cannot be done because of the uh, the multitude of factors that play uh, for the capture. I mean, play in field. So again, uh, we have this uh, lot of species also coming in. So uh, we really find it difficult to implement uh, such. Uh, technical measures and so uh, we can definitely say that an ideal gear never exists but then it is a you know uh, it's an optimization uh, between what we intend to do whether it is increasing the catches or decreasing the bycatch so it's a you know fine balance between uh, all these uh, uh, you know our objectives but then um, when we see about, I mean, uh, if you say that uh, an ideal gear will catch only one uh, one fish or uh, one type of fish and one of one length, but then uh, is it really possible? Uh, because we have fisheries uh, targeting fishes at different trophic levels and also uh, different fishing gears, which are based on uh, the, the behavioral aspects of fishes, uh, which are at different trophic levels. So uh, something like, you know, uh, I found this interesting. Uh, uh, what they have mentioned is like, the, this is something like an unbalanced fishery. The leftmost graph, what you see here. So this is, you know, this fishery catches uh, fishes mostly in the upper tropic levels. So maybe it is a long line. So, but then they say it's not uh, a balanced fishing. So it's unbalanced and something like here, which, which may be a persine or insane, which catches lower in the tropic level. So what happens here is that we are not you know, capturing it as, uh, you know, it's not balanced captured. Uh, again, uh, the balanced fishery should look something like this. It's not that we use one gear, but then a multitude of gears where each fish or each, uh, the quantity of fish at each tropical level is systematically removed. But again, that is not a possibility, but then we could you know, work towards that. And ever, you know, uh, the, the same paper, uh, they say because uh, they say this, and I found this interesting because uh, when compared to the, the terrestrial systems, uh, where we see where I think most of our uh, feeding habits are concentrated on this level or the first and second level. So there is no one who takes lion or wolf for food. So there's a third level. And similarly, if you see the right side, so no one takes no human takes zooplankton. It just 
the sardines. We start from sardines. So that the third level, in fact. So third, fourth, and fifth. So fifth, you know, <laughs> towards the left, you see the eaters of lion eaters. So nothing of that sort. So that this must be one of the reasons why we should be very careful when uh, exploiting the fisheries chain. Because we start from the third level and then go upward, go up, upward. So uh, there's the reason why, like there was a paper in 2003, I think, which, uh, you know, by Worm at all, which showed that, uh, in which they argue that by 2014, 45, the, all the fishes would be gone. Uh, but that was not a reality. And then they have changed the results later on. Uh, uh, but then, but then, of course, if you see this uh, trophic level, um, you know, uh, capture, we see that the fisheries is, you know, quite high in the level. So that might be the reason why it affects quite fast. And then gear layer technical measures accepted globally. We are coming directly to the, uh, the main topic here. So, uh, the in fact, there are basically uh, two types of uh, devices. The so one is the mechanical devices, which is mostly size related, where you find the tight no more device, JPS, SD, and all these things, where you have a physical separation happening there. So, once the fish or a group of fish comes there, uh, they are physically separated and then either they, are, they go in or move out, out of the net. And then there are another set of uh, devices which consider behavioral differences of these species that are being considered. Like uh, you have this uh, cutaway trolls, short body trolls, I think we'll discuss about that. So which in fact uh, uh, doesn't allow the fish or, or, or gives the opportunity for the juveniles or fishes or bycatch to not enter the gear itself and then escape. But then before that, before entering, it's an opportunity for them to move out. And uh, of course, uh, the escape openings uh, is a very important factor. So the whatever we see the most important measure, but like what we have adopted here in the square mesh. So it's basically uh, increasing the, the, the mesh lumen so that the juveniles or unwanted cats uh, get an opportunity to move out. So all these, you know, big eye, fish eyes, fire mesh panels, all these are in fact increasing the, the mesh lumen or the escape opening. So these are basically the two types of classifications, the basic classification. And if you see uh, our works from the Indian waters uh, till 90s, we see that uh, most of the work where we carried out in CFT because uh, there was a specific division for this uh, uh, fishing technology. So till 90s, early 90s, sorry, we see that there was increased stress on increasing the efficiency of gears for all the gears, in fact, traps, gill nets, uh, uh, scenes, everything. But then gradually this, you know, post 90s, we see a lot of literature. In fact, uh, it just a, a cursory, uh, I was just going through literature. We see that from, I think it was from 1994 or so, where we started this actual work on improving the selectivity of uh, trolls specifically. So we see a lot of work coming on selectivity, responsible fishing gears, energy conservation, and then how to reduce bycatch, discards, and everything. And then, uh, yeah, the, uh, and then if you see most of these works, I think almost all of the works are bas basically trial and error method. So we really don't know like what's really happening underwater. And that is one of the, the biggest drawbacks that we have in gear technology because uh, we really don't know. Uh, we, we, we design a gear, we operate it, we field test it, and then we get a result. So the, the results are purely based on the catch, what we get. So it's mostly a trial and error method. So if you find a good escapement, we say maybe it could be due to the gear, but then it, it might not be also because there are a n number of factors that affect the catch of the gear. So that was not uh, considered. So it was blind. Uh, and alternatives is we could you know, uh, observe the fishes, uh, make a small, like what we do in a flume tank and all, maybe, maybe a miniature version of the gear and then try it. But then it, it, it's not, maybe it, it is like 50% to the, the actual field trials, but then it's, it's not always the best option because best option would be actual field trials, do it continuously, replicate it, but then the very important factor is the cost involved. And then uh, coming to the mechanical devices, uh, where I was mentioning in the earlier slide, uh, the most of them, in fact, uh, separate physically. So what they do is that uh, the fish has to enter, and then based on the size, it gets 
you know, segregated. But then what happens here is uh, the mortality of the fish that is escaping out. The escaping ones are juveniles. So where the swimming fest, I mean, abilities uh, would be you know, seriously you know, affected once they move out because they have to travel along with the stroll for some time. And then maybe their reserves are all you know, exhausted and then they may, get, they may be easy prey. So we really don't know like what's happening. So escape mortality is an issue and we simply don't know how many survive. So if 50% of them survive and go out, we don't know how many of that 50% really survive in the field. And also I was mentioning about the factors, uh, which includes, you know, uh, I was mentioning the, the, the catch or the size of the catch, the, the weight of the catch, what we get, depends on a lot of factors like duration of the haul, the time of the haul, the temperature of water, catch size, catch size in sense the, the size, the, the size of the cordon, but that also affects the escape uh, of the juveniles, the size of fish. And then we don't know, even in fact, maybe other, a lot of factors which we really cannot account. And when considering the, the behavior part, uh, this is quite interesting because uh, maybe a lot of works coming in with regard to light we see that uh, some specific color lights, LED lights uh, are found to, you know, avoid turtles. So turtles avoid these uh, LED uh, lights. So the, the, all these like, and also recently we have done a study on the gillnets, uh, which we see that there is a specific uh, length differences in the way different colored gillnets uh, capture fishes. So all these in fact are, uh, you know, quite, you know, promising. Uh, considering the behavioral aspect, not the mechanical one. So behavioral is al always behavioral related. Uh, development of gear is always beneficial, but then it takes a lot of time. And also the findings, what we, we have in lab may not translate into actual you know, results in the field. Coming to a, uh, the technical, uh, the modifications that is possible in a trawl. Uh, this you know this is a typical trawl underwater. So we have the the water boats, doors, the bridles. So all these areas uh, we could do some modification so that it, it could be made more responsible. So the most of these works, uh, most of the work to make it more you know uh, selective are done in the cordant in Indian waters. So we have tried uh, different types of cordants, different shapes of cordants. And then also the grids. So the grids comes just before the cordant where the physical separation happens. And then based on the size of the fish, it gets segregated. And also uh, I will show you an example of where we have uh, considered reducing the total length of this belly so that fishes get an opportunity to move out. So um, that is specifically for shrimps because shrimps have a reduced swimming capabilities than fish. So fishes get an opportunity to move out. And also bridles, we have not done much work, but then uh, the, the trawl dose we have done, uh, especially the off bottom trawl systems, where uh, the idea was to reduce the um, impact to the bottom. So these are in fact, some of these technical devices, you know, I have mentioned it as experimented because except for those last two, the square mesh and threads, uh, nothing, I know most of them are from our department vessels. And uh, uh, yeah, as I was mentioning earlier, the cost part is quite important here because uh, each trial would, you know, would, would, would uh, require a lot of money to uh, do it. So most of these, you know, these works were carried out in Indian vessels, I mean, in our department vessels and only these square mesh and threads. So we have an exhaustive study in commercial trawlers also. So um, specifically uh, with regard, I, I think I have already mentioned it. Uh, basically, it is making more space to escape so that they can juveniles, if you're concentrating on juveniles, so ju juveniles can wiggle out of these improved opening of the lumen. Uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and also the uh, mentioning about the gill nets, the color cues can be used to you know uh, allow them to escape or to have a selective capture of uh, of length of particular length classes. And this is uh, actually yeah, increasing, uh, just to show you like how an increase in mesh size can affect the catches. So here, like we see uh, this 
in 1992 and 2005 6 we have uh, used two different I mean, in fact there are four types of uh, quadrant so we see that there is a significant you know decrease in the bycatch if the quadrant mesh size is increased and also the catch characteristics also so definitely there is an improvement in the catch when the quadrant mesh size is improved so uh, that's where like uh, uh, most of us most of the states have come up with regulations uh, in uh, to increase the mesh size so most of them uh, in indian waters we see the cordons have almost 20 to 25 mm size so uh, most of the states are now suggesting for, 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 to go for a 40 mm square mesh cordon so this is definitely or this is would be definitely beneficial because it improves the the mesh lumen And uh, uh, thanks to CMFRA, where they have come out with a lot with the MLS for the species. Because before that, we used to have uh, the L50 values, and then used to compare. Uh, so this was, in, in fact, a very important for, for gear technologies because at least we know where we have this uh, where to stop. In fact, because you have something a kind of a yardstick to to base our work on to ba base our work on. So to how much to catch or how much what is the size or what is the maximum allowable. Uh, mesh uh, to have an optimum you know, capture rates and all. So this is a typical uh, uh, selectivity curve of a quadrant, I mean of a troll net, sorry. So the, the red line is what we find the, the mean selection curve, and then you find the other uh, uh, lines, those are different halls. So each hall each hall would have a different selection curve because it depends on the number of uh, fishes that has entered, the length class of the fish that has entered. The basic idea, like earlier we used to do, uh, is the cover quadrant uh, method, where the proportion uh, of the retained was assessed, and then we come out with the logistic model. And then uh, the, the, there, are, there has been a considerable improvement in the, uh, in the selection, uh, in deriving the selection properties of gears. So now we normally go for GLM -M techniques, GLM -M techniques, uh, where two quadrants itself can be compared. So that is that could be more accurate than uh, the cover quadrant because the cover once it is installed on top of uh, the quadrant, it could affect the the catch rate and also the escapement opportunities. So that is uh, there. But then uh, we found this uh, this setup to be quite uh, you know useful for our commercial operations because. Uh, what happens is like uh, fishermen, if you go out at field and then uh, say them, uh, tell them that, say, uh, if you use 40 mm, there is no going to be much loss. So immediately they would say that there'll be huge loss happening. So what we normally do is that we operate, when we do commercial operations, we keep a cover on top of the cordon. So they get a visual, you know, uh, representation of how much has been escaped. So that's how like uh, I'll come to that uh, studies later on. Uh, we see, so this is in fact the general setup of uh, deriving selection parameters. So what we do here is uh, we get a selection curve, something which looks uh, like this. I think this is for Johnny's Dismary. And uh, this is L50, this is prior to MLS. So for this species, it was 7.5 mm. And then we go and find out like what is the proportion retained. So that is, uh, no, I mean, the other way around, we see what is the 0.5% of this. So this is L50 value for that. And based on this L50, we can, in fact, uh, we derive a selection factor. And then uh, with the selection factor, we suggest an optimum size for the uh, quadrant. So this is, in fact, like what we do for uh, the quadrant mesh sizes. And uh, yeah, I think this is in fact uh, the, the same selection curve and then why fishermen are uh, you know, apprehensive about uh, you know, using such selective gears. And this is in fact the selection curve. So what you find here is the immediate loss, uh, what's happening to the fishermen because this is L50. So they lose this portion of it. And uh, this is in fact uh, what fishermen lose, but then it's a loss for, for us, for them, but then in the long term, it's good because these are the escaped species. It goes out, and a typical, you know, an ideal fishing uh, selection curve would be a straight line. So that's what, in fact, that means like any fish that is less than 7.55 centimeters should not be caught. 
and all of those fish which is greater than uh, in length of 7.55 will be caught in the net the other one will be released so normally a straight line is not a possibility so that's the reason why i told an ideal fishing gear will not exist So, uh, in terms of like uh, uh, the, the technical measures that are adopted in India, uh, we see this uh, size and shape of the measures. Like we have these most of these uh, states which are you know uh, started this. They started with Gujarat, in fact, in 2003, which stipulated square mesh cordons, 40 mm square mesh cordons to be used. So, size and shape also. So, square mesh and size 40 mm. So, these are the type of technical measures you know, normally given by the different uh, policy makers. And size of the gears gear used. So we have, uh, I think, the size of the gear. In fact, was came first in the Kerala MLR, MLR, ML, uh, Marine Fish MFRA, where uh, the size of the gill nets and also the the ring scenes was specified here. And then, uh, of course, we have this MLS uh, in the regulations. And then. Uh, like bycatch reduction device, of course, square mesh cordon is a bycatch reduction, but then again, the TED is also you know, coming up in a big way. And then we, I think most of us know that the exports to US is now, the wild ship exports to US is now banned because of this issue. Because uh, the TED which we have been using was well, not approved by NOAA. And then, I mean, we, we recently had someone from CFT who had gone there and then done underwater trials uh, so the design is now finalized and the only thing is like it needs to be popularized in the indian uh, waters and then uh, vessel size we have a, a, a restrictions also the engine power uh, the method of operation like bull trolling is banned light trolling light fishing is banned so all these are, are all you know technical measures that are adopted in, in some or all of indian uh, indian states and also uh, the gear marking to find out like uh, uh, if a gear is lost and it could be traced back. That is also there in the, the recent MFRA of Kerala. So I will just uh, go to uh, the different uh, types of uh, the BRDs that we have tried. So this is a square mesh window. This we have tried in the bagnet uh, of uh, Ugly, uh, where it was a success. In fact, we found a significant escapement of Kilsa Juveniles was happening. And also we have tried it in trolls also in Cochin waters. And this is the square mesh cordon. So here, like the difference is like that. Here the entire cordon is, is made of square mesh, but then here there's only a panel. So of course, if you see the, the escapement is much more uh, in the square mesh cordon itself. So some of our studies, uh, like what we are doing with 25 mm mesh size, we see like, uh, you know, the escapement, it's not much in fact. So this is like the uh, the square mesh cordons. What we do, uh, we put a cover on top and then find out. So this is the length, like what we capture. Uh, also, also the length of the uh, inner and outer, and then that's how we derive the the selection curve for the different fishes. And then this is an, again a very you know uh, promising uh, BRD. The, the shrimp loss here you see this is one aspect like we need to take care like when we design or you know, implement a, a bycatch reduction device because the shrimp loss is one of the biggest issues that we had and bycatch here this is a fisheye brd and we've signed we see that the bycatch reduction is almost 20 percent average but then the shrimp loss is also quite low so this is one probable uh, brd that could be suggested uh, uh, for the uh, indian waters this is specifically for shrimps because here uh, the juvenile fishes have an opportunity to you know, move, swim out, and then uh, the shrimps would remain there. And I was mentioning about changing the size of, I mean, uh, the, the region of the mouth where there, there could be a possibility to reduce bycatch. So this is a cutaway belly that we have designed and uh, tested along coaching waters. So here we see the traditional uh, the CPUE is a bit reduced, but that is mostly due to the escapement of bycatch and the shrimp catch, the upper one, it's not much of difference. There's no significant difference. So, you know, some small, you know, small modifications to the trawl can make it more selective. Just to highlight some of these, uh, uh, yeah, this is the shrimps, comparison of shrimps, CPV. So not much of a difference, almost the same. So only the fish juveniles get reduced here. 
and also concurrently we find with that reduction in the uh, the top part we also uh, reduce the uh, the surface area of the drop of the net which in terms is like uh, you know uh, savings in the diesel also the, the fuel used and this is another design which we have tried uh, this is the short body trawl uh, this is in fact overall the the size or the length of the trawl is reduced so uh, the heading mechanism doesn't work much well here so what happens is like the fishes can you know escape out swim out and the shrimps like which have reduced capability of swimming they just you know get trapped here we caught it again the no significant reduction in the shrimp catch what we find and the reduction of bycatch is around 10 kg per hour cpv significant reduction in fact and this is another device uh, which we have tried a long back uh, but uh, this is basically a shrimp uh, sorting device and also a brd where it has two uh, this is like exactly where the separation happens the fish would come here and based on the grid size the shrimps would enter here and the fish which are bigger in size goes on the upper panel and the upper panel has square mesh cordons uh, this in the initial design we had the 60 mm square meshes so this can be in fact optimized for a region and the down for uh, um, shrimps we have this 20 mm square mesh so the juveniles of shrimp can escape out similarly for the juveniles the fish juveniles also can escape out so this uh, was another or is another uh, good uh, brd which could be tried for the indian waters similarly we have tried uh, tested i mean we have tested that and then also uh, taken out the uh, the length classification in weight also we see that there's no significant difference in the shrimp uh, catches and also there is a uh, separation happening in the uh, you know, terms of fish and uh, shrimp and fish and i think most of you know this uh, ted so this was a cft design ted uh, and this is no longer you know recognized uh, the very good part of this was like you know the shrimp uh, catches i mean shrimp loss was very very less almost 1% so we have compared this to other other designs of tets and there's the reason i mean uh, it was in 2003 uh, 2003 where we have come out with design which had a very low uh, shrimp loss but then our uh, the mesh grid size was quite big and this is the new cft tet and then the, a picture from the recent trials uh, conducted in noa uh, where you see this uh, the grid here the new grid and then uh, the flap on top of uh, this so here this is an opening here so the when the turtles come uh, they hit this grid and then they go out and you can see the ceiling here it's quite perfect so this is underwater thing so fishes like they they don't have this you know uh, weight or even the, the strength to lift this flap and go up but then turtles do have that so once a turtle comes it goes out but not the fish so then this is awaiting uh, field trials in our indian waters and then just an overview of different uh, uh, brds that we have tried uh, so i was telling the big eye brd uh, the fish eye brd quite promising and and with this the shrimp loss the minimum and also around 40 50% of bycatch exclusion and then most of these studies uh, in fact uh, this was a review uh, we have done in 2018 uh, where we see that uh, when i think it from 1991 till 2017 so all these studies like where the selection parameters were carried out we have taken out these studies and then plotted it and we see that if you use a diamond mesh and a square mesh cordon the selection factor that's the main you no know, uh, the the value the the value that we get after doing all these selection studies so selection factor should be high for a year so you see here like if we compare both uh, diamond and square mesh cordon the selection factor for each l50 is quite high in case of uh, the square meshes the red line similarly the optimum meshes required is definitely less because selection factor is high so this is you know uh, the all the dots you find are those studies like where we have found out the l50 or the optimum mesh size so uh, and also another one uh, uh, we have recently started this is student work uh, where we have used uh, pingers because dolphins or cetaceans are a big issue now in uh, our fisheries because they come and eat away the catches and also cause huge loss to the 
the uh, net because they bite it and then it's a huge loss for the fishermen. So uh, we have tried this uh, acoustic pingers. Uh, we, in fact, it's a deterrent device where they emit sound, which is beyond our uh, capacity to hear, but then the cetaceans can hear it because they are based on echolocation. So uh, we see that there is a significant improvement uh, in terms of uh, you know, loss of, uh, I mean, in reduction in the loss of fishing days and also loss in terms of replacing webbing. So, but then uh, the issue is like when we talk to most of these uh, fishers who have used it, these, they say that the habituation is a problem here because once they get used to the, the sound waves, uh, maybe uh, they would stay away for maybe one month or so or even less. And then again, they start coming. So, so the efficiency of these devices gets reduced. So the trials are going on in fact. So again, some studies in commercial conditions. So initially I was mentioning only the square mesh cord and NTED, where these are the two de devices like we have tried in commercial conditions. Uh, this was a work carried out in Malvan, Maharashtra. Uh, in fact, long story short, in fact, there is like no loss happening. So whatever loss uh, happens to the fishermen in terms of you know, uh, the escape of juveniles, uh, we find that it's around you know, 2.5 kilograms per hour or so. But then uh, concurrently, there is a you know, gain in terms of re reduce, re reduced drag offered by the square mesh cordons. So whatever they're losing, they're gaining in fact. So we see, uh, so this was in fact done uh, in real field conditions and they, they were convinced. And then uh, around 300 or so odd uh, vessels that were operating along the Sindhuru district, they all converted to square mesh cordons at that time. And again, a combined study by CMFRA, CFT, where uh, it was carried out in Gujarat again in the private vessels. So this is the geographical extent like where we have done. Uh, Madhu sir, are you there? I think your voice got disconnected now. Oh, sorry, we, uh, sir, you are there? Sir, you are muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Uh, now uh, we can hear you. There was a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know where. Uh... Uh, you stopped at the uh, slide showing case study. Case study. case study of Singapore? No, no, uh, two. Case study two. CMFRA, MPDA, CFT. Okay, okay. okay. This one, right? Yes, yes, yes. Before this one, yeah. So this is like a study like we have uh, uh, conducted uh, of Gujarat uh, showing, you know, positive results. Um, again, in the commercial vessels itself, uh, another one in uh, the Park Bay uh, in collaboration with MSS Saraf. But again, uh, most of our BRDs, at least four of them were tried and then uh, very encouraging results in sense. Uh, so this government of uh, Tamil Nadu has in fact uh, asked us to demonstrate it in other, uh, I mean, other districts also in, in, in collaboration with the WWF and MSS Saraf. And, uh, A field trial angle in Kerala also shows encouraging results uh, where we see that uh, the even though the catches are a bit lower when in these in the diamond mesh, the profit what they realized, so the revenue what they realized was quite high it's just because of the size of the shrimps. You know, this was specifically for shrimp trawling. 
so i think that's the that was the case studies like what we had uh, in fact most of them uh, have shown really positive benefits and so to uh, to sum it up in fact uh, so the crucial question that we need to ask uh, before implementing any, any technical measure is how large a change in mesh is possible because this is directly related to the loss immediate loss like what's happening to the fishermen and then if, if at all it is there then how long it will take for the economic benefits you know to uh, to, to get it back and then also the uh, whatever technical measures be implemented it's very easy for the fishermen to you know negate it like say if it is wire mesh cordon a very simple thing would be to you know put it on top another mesh so that the entire thing is you know negated so it's very easy unless it, it's like comes uh, within them within them or like maybe most of them should you know uh, um, should be something like a collaborative type of work uh, then then we need to compensate for potential losses so initially it could be something like uh so helping those people who are willing to do it and then go forward then other measures also are there uh, and then of course you know uh, as i was mentioning like the gear based technical measures can address uh, juvenile bycatch to a great extent uh, at least we have seen many of the cases like the the bycatch reduction is almost 30 to 50 percentage um uh, but most of these devices particularly the uh, square mesh cordons uh, they are very you know very easy to incorporate but some others like jfs sg which was I, which i was showing may require some training even treads also would require a bit of training for them to to you know implement it to act to uh, install in their to rig it on their uh, you know, on their gears then uh, you know by mortality uh, i was mentioning the escape mortality could be an issue because uh, we really don't know like what's happening once they move out of the gear uh, the best option in this would be in fact the spatial or temporal uh, temporal closures so that uh, there is no interaction happening between the fish and the the gear or the bycatch of the gear and the behavioral response in fact there is a best thing that we can have and to avoid the non targets and uh, uh, the close association with fishermen community will significantly help in the implementation of whatever research like we have come out come out and compliance uh, strict mcs uh, that must be there and i think uh, most of them i think i have explained i think the one of the best option would be to reduce effort itself uh, for in sense like uh, we have i have talked about the uh, technology creep and also uh, the more science we need into this you know uh, how uh, these gears act under water what happens to the fishes once they move out of the gear and all those things so i think i will stop with this thank you uh, thank you much sir for delivering uh, this excellent talk and to thanks to all who joined talk today for the talk uh, before we go to discussion or leave the party please provide us with the uh, feedback of about the today's talk the link to the uh, fill the feedback is provided in the chat box uh, the talk was uh, i should say the talk was really informative and uh, enlightened about the recent developments in the fishing gears in of india uh, now let us move into the discussion part we have 15 minutes for discussion please use your hand raise feature Uh, if you have a question to ask, or you can type in the chat box. So shall I stop sharing? Ah, uh -huh, sir, you can share. Yeah. We can uh, you. stop sharing. Maybe, sir, can you share your email address in the chat box for everyone? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir has shared his email address in the chat box. So, if you have any uh, query to contact him, you can contact him later. Uh, uh, sir, uh, I think there is no doubts in the chat box. Maybe coming. Uh, sir, I I have a doubt that uh, you were mentioning about the minimum conservation size also along with the MLS. No. So, what exactly it is uh, differs from MLS and minimum conservation size? 
I think uh, uh, it's basically MLS itself. I think what uh, uh, the discussion like uh, which uh, which I had with uh, uh, Sunil Mohammed sir, uh-huh. so what in fact <laughs> they were he was mentioning was the MLS is exactly not you know purely related to the biological. Uh, biological. Okay, okay. okay. It may be the conservation size may be more related to its yeah. uh, size at maturity or something yeah. like that. Or uh, I want to know uh, we have a uh, Kerala have introduced MLS. So most of the species have MLS now. Huh? It is species specific will be no mostly the legal size of the species. Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah it's it's different for different species so that okay. is one uh, one issue also in fact uh, so what the government says is the, when the uh, you know the ruling has come out the uh, regulations have come out they have not mentioned they have just mentioned about the mls not about the uh, the quantity in fact so there is a you know something called uh, as i was mentioning there is some, nothing called a perfect gear which catches exactly at that level so what happens is you take any gear you will have <laughs> at least some species which is below and above mls so maybe we should give fishermen a chance also like say if, if he has 20 percent by catch of mm-hmm. by catch in sense which are lower in the mls mm-hmm. so he should be you know he should not be punished so something of that sort so uh what i think same for suggests is the 50 percent uh, uh you know best, F- 50%, F- yeah oh. in terms of weight so if, okay. if it and, is uh, 50 percent then they can charge something like that Okay, okay. And to what extent our fishers are aware of the MLS of uh, the their target species and all? They are all aware of the there is an MLS uh, or they can't catch below that. Like that. to all yeah, our yeah. Kerala, they are well aware. In fact, more than the scientific uh, people, I think they are very aware of that. Yeah, because there are issues because they are the sufferers. In fact, maybe in case if they are catching specifically for juveniles, there are issues like where they specifically target target target. Uh, okay. By catch, but then there are other issues also. Uh, in fact, like I was mentioning, we don't know like what's happening underwater uh, specifically. Okay. So there are chances that the juniors also can come. So they they are well aware. At least in Kerala, yeah. they are well aware. Yeah. They are well aware. Okay, 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 sir. And there is some uh, doubt by Abdul Maji. Uh, he has. Uh, hey, Sajina, there is one question uh, by Neetu before that. Okay, maybe I, I can you read it, please, because I lost that chat. I got disconnected. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get that one. Uh, so she is asking, "Hello, sir. For today's presentation, which which data set and method was used?" Uh, is it regarding a particular regarding... work? A particular work she might have asked because there were a lot of work she sir yeah. explained. Yeah, I think she asked this halfway through the presentation. Anyway, is she she is not online? I think so. Okay, okay. Then if she comes online, she can ask directly. Okay, who is that actually? And I didn't I mean hear the who the person was. Neetu. Okay. Uh, there is another question by uh, Abdul Majid. How to reduce manpower, energy expense, time gap between harvest to landing, etc. Uh, if Abdul Majid Majid is here online, he can ask directly also to sir. I think he's not responding, sir. Yeah, in fact, uh, how to reduce manpower? I don't know, like what he meant. Maybe. Uh, uh, Maybe effort. Yeah, mm-hmm. effort in sense. How to reduce in sense? That is like it's a political decision. <laughs> that when we uh, really don't know the answer. That is one of the biggest issues like we are facing. How to you know reduce? If in fact it is not about you know uh, it's uh, the main effort. Like in the last slide, I was mentioning the main. The crux is like reducing the effort. So uh, yesterday's vessel, yesterday's trawler is not the same as today's trawler. It is just 2.4 times better. I was mentioning of the technology. Yes, yes. So I don't know because it just MCS. Uh, you have to have controls both in terms of vessel uh, size, gear size. It's all there in many of these regulations, but then implementation is a big problem. So I think he has mentioned about technical solutions. Technical solutions, I think. Uh, I am not in favor of you know again improving the technical solutions. If it is basically for you know uh, manpower or re- reducing uh, the number of people on board, then uh, it can be more mechanized. But then we have to have a reduction in the number of vessels. 
because in Australia and all, like uh, uh, it's maybe two or three people who have managed the vessel. But our conditions, particularly in trawlers, we have many people in fact. So we really don't have restrictions with regard to uh, the number of, uh, we don't have uh, a licensed gear after all. So there is no, nothing called a licensed gear that we have, licensed trawl. Anyone can use anyone, any design. So in that case, whatever effort we, we, we do to reduce the effort, it could, it could come in other way, like it could be a bigger trawl net. So this would get negated. So there are a lot of things should come, you know, they should all work in tandem for this to happen. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, there is uh, far no questions in the uh, chat. Sajana, I, I have a query. I don't know if it's even a valid question. This is Mukta. So, uh, when uh, Madhu, great talk. And uh, so, when we have all these, you know, it's obviously not for the lack of technology. So, we have, uh, you know, suggesting, for example, a square mesh cotton, and you let a lot of fish escape. So basically those do not come into the fishery. And I was more thinking more in terms of the stock assessment part where we actually don't get to see those small fish, even though they may be getting caught some minerals in some other gear, I don't know. So I don't know how all that is going to affect stock assessments in the future when we take data from commercial fisheries or, you know, so it's just, you know, I just had a doubt. I don't even know if it's relevant here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Mukta. Yeah, it's a good question. In fact, uh, yeah, that is an issue. <laughs> like, how do we account for that in the stock assessments? Uh, so, in normal cases, what they have done is there are studies by not recent ones, but then it was in 1994, 97, and then I think again in one more study, I don't remember. Uh, what they have done is they have assumed that 50% of these escapees survive. So, that's right. how they do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Some kind of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the estimate has to be done. Yeah. True. True. And, uh, and there is, in fact, only one study by Petri Suronan where it has come as a, out as an FAO. Uh, uh -huh. where, uh, uh -huh. I think you must have seen that. So, yeah. that, in fact, it's a big large scale study where what, what they've done is the quadrant, entire quadrant they have separated it out and kept out at sea. So, in our conditions, like it's impossible. So the best of, of alternative is like to say it like 50 or 40 percent survival. Yeah. Have you ever used any underwater cameras for your cordons? I don't know. I came in a bit late, so I was not sure. No, in fact, not not in sense like we just have tried a few times, but then not on a regular basis or to okay. or for quantifying and all. No, we are not used. But no, no one they, use, they generally use no people use quite a lot of underwater video uh, work to quantify, you know, their bycatch and escapement and things like that yeah they use it but not for i have not found any studies where they're quantified using uh, cameras they just find out whether the device is working right or not so most of these studies are basically for that i mean they have used it for that like okay. i think you must have seen the a great video where the a, a uh, dolphin is coming near the the outlet of the brd so okay. it's coming there and staying there so that he knows uh, fishes will come out so yeah. for that i mean that sort of work the, okay. other, the other issue will be the visibility in our waters <laughs> cannot compare yeah the other. No, that's true that's true absolutely good evening madhu a very informative talk yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> I didn't know that you were here. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm here. I'm very well here. A very informative talk. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the way you presented it. Yeah, thank you, sir. So I think Grinson has asked uh, uh, whether the... Uh, yes, small there scale. is a question. Can you yeah, read, out, read out the question for the whole... YouTube. Uh, okay. Uh, the question is considering the industrial trolling in developed fishery, all our fishing can be considered more or less small scale. Uh, if Grincesar is online, he can directly ask also. Yeah, I think uh, that's what they do. I think it's mostly considered small scale. Uh, based on their standards, ours is small scale. And that's, that's what, in fact, Empera also tells. Yeah, but uh, basically, uh, still, when the fishery is small scale, the type of imposition coming from developed countries to bring in more and more uh, conservation measures into the fishing, it is really 
what we can say creating a problem on the economic divide like they have already developed technology and our fishermen is still struggling for subsistence it's more 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 or less we can say political but still uh, uh, there has to be some serious measures in this regard like to project our fisheries and recently in the world trade organization talks also they were indicating like the subsidies should be stopped all those sort of things are coming in but still uh, we can say that our fishermen requires all the, and we strongly defended that and this is the first time i think india defended it very strongly yeah. So same uh, with all the regional fishery management organizations, also same issues come up when it comes to IOTC. Our uh, quota and their quota seems to be quite uh, different. So all those issues are there. So I think uh, such things also should be projected when uh, such uh, trade sort of embargo is coming for Indian fishery. That's what I want to emphasize. Yeah, yeah correct. Don't you think that the impact of uh, some of these things, like, of course, like catching a lot of juveniles and all, the impact is equally bad. Whether there is an embargo or not, the ecological and the stock impacts are still happening. So we have to somehow manage those, whether we have external pressure or not. Shouldn't that also be part of it? I mean, you know, balancing out everything. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But then one option would be, you know, uh, whatever in terms of subsidies also, we, we can in fact directly relate it to adoption of these responsible measures. Absolutely. At least they Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I think and we yeah, have, uh, that, yeah, we uh, you know, come out with, as I was rightly saying, we need to like, make a I mean, draw a line somewhere. So otherwise, you know, it's going to be difficult. And just to add on, like earlier you were saying MLS, such now Kerala fishermen like Madhu was saying is very aware, but you ask something, uh, an AP fisherman, he has no idea and they're least bothered and it, it no, is not no, in no, any no, way, no. yeah. No, no, I, no, I, I strongly object that because uh, now uh, the Kerala Fisheries Department is taking serious measures into these actions and the, the actions are in the platform now. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's no, what I'm saying. It is very no, no, specific now, to Kerala. Now, now the leaders all, like almost all the leaders are like from different categories, different political parties. The fisheries department has coordinated in such a nice manner that they are brought into single platform where the fishermen leaders are discussing the relevance of... Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. It's great and it's been done great, very nicely in Kerala. But yeah. you come to another state, the fisheries exactly. department, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And, and you know, everyone, it's like uh, nobody is really very bothered about all that. So unless it comes into the MFRA and there's like Madhu said, the implementation is done properly, it's just not going to... Now, one one model state, uh, other states are picking up and uh, adopting yes. the same... Yes. At least Tamil Nadu seems yeah. to be... Yeah, yeah. Up all, all, so all are hopefully. copying the policy frameworks yeah. what's being developed in Kerala. But Kerala is bestowed with... Uh, uh, two major fisheries institutes. So always the department get their support. So other yeah. states we have yeah. centers only and the yeah. manpower is not sufficient enough to yeah. gather their yeah. needs. So Absolutely. it is being copied and better frameworks are being developed. Yeah. I think Sridhar sir may add on to that. So. Yeah, yeah. Should, we, yeah. should we not talk about the coast wise? See, I feel that it should be the coast wise. Like East Coast should have the common policies with the, all the states uh, sitting together and working out the solution similarly with the west coast that would be the best solution that's what i feel yeah yeah i think sir can i add um in fact uh, it, yeah it was a good suggestion in fact cmfr has in fact already done that the department of fisheries kerala government i think 2018 i think recent where all these southern states have come together west coast uh, Kerala, uh, even um, uh, Goa, yes, yes. Karnataka, and it was a very, very one of the best initiatives that could have happened to fisheries. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that was, a, in fact, many of these outcome of this MFRA, that was based on that meeting which we had. It was quite good. And also, one more thing I would like to add is, uh, in adding to like what uh, Vincent was saying about the, uh, the awareness of Kerala fishermen. Recently, we had a uh, stakeholder meeting in uh, CMFRA, where all these traditional and we are I mean, uh, trawl owners all. I mean, trawl operators all had come. So, uh, in fact, th there is a you know a per perception really coming in that we should sh uh, you know save our stocks and everything. And then the traditional fishermen they were suggesting that uh, I don't know many are there from same it, it seems like uh, this year the sardine catches are going to be quite high, quite high because there are a lot of juveniles out there in sea this year. So what they were suggesting is that they are willing to voluntarily stop fishing for this. So that they could survive. So definitely, that 
because it has to come from them itself. I mean, the initiative has to come from them, and then Kerala is like a good example for that. Yeah, I, I just also, I totally agree with you. Actually, it happened during the year fourteen fifteen on the east coast, especially the Vishakapatnam coast, when there were uh, subsidies issued for converting your vessels to long lines. So there was a bit low in uh, shrimp catches uh, on Andhra coast. So people were hurrying up to convert the vessels into long liners and they were targeting tunas uh, on the east coast. So suddenly the pressure on uh, the bottom resources came down. And after two to three years, when the pressure came down, that was not a deliberate attempt, but happened due to the subsidy schemes and other things which came in. There was a huge increase in the catch back. So again, uh, they went back to their old system and started trawling for bottom resources and catching yes. prawns. So by default, it happened. So this this is what now probably the Kerala fishermen are thinking of. There should be, like you could always think about uh, stopping for a, a, a two years and then again starting third year or fourth year. And again, that could be a really good idea. Yes, it works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, Pramod yeah, Kiran sir has raised his, he want to talk, I think. Oh. Thank you, Sajina. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Madhu, it was a wonderful presentation. We rarely get somebody, an expert from fishing technology for a talk. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm just a curious guy standing on the periphery, so... I just want, I would like to ask, uh, what is this uh, light fishing? Uh, is it so much in our cost uh, that uh, we need to prohibit it, ban it? Uh, uh, because uh, why I asked is like uh, during the last trawl ban in uh, uh, Trivandrum coast, I was visiting some beaches and uh, the only recognizable fishing vessels uh, were having these heavy lights on them. So then I was like confused, like, do we have it so much here in our state or uh, is it the, like, is it some other, uh, other states coming here during the season? Uh, you have any idea about this uh, light fishing in our coastline? Yeah, thank you, Pramod. Uh, in fact, uh, not much in our waters, but then Goa, uh, there is a lot of uh, light fishing happening. And then also in Karnataka. I mean, maybe these Goan vessels are coming, we don't know. But I think in our coast, I think it's not much. Maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe a very rare case like what where you've seen. Uh, yeah, because I could see it from Shangumagam Beach within like maybe two, two three kilometers. Uh, a couple of vessels moving in. It was during the trawl band time. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm not very sure. <laughs> yeah, but, very okay, okay. But trawl band in that case, like uh, Goa, I think uh, they normally don't go, you know, during trawl band. No, no, I am, I am, I, I think our own people have started using this because uh, maybe our authorities are ready to come to terms with this kind of new. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, fish face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Jena, Vincent, you see anything, Vincent? Uh, Vincent, uh, Vincent, 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 put a comment in the chat box. Okay, yes, comment there. I just, just, I yes, no, he has, uh, Vincent sir has commented. Rather than ecological damage by fishing, we have a serious vulnerability to climate change. Considering the small scale nat nature and climate variable vulnerability, we should have separate incentivized package to support better fishing methods. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Can I have, ask a few questions? Um, yeah, please. Sure, please ask. Um, so, um, uh, good, good, excellent talk and. Um, it's uh, something you know you don't get very often to hear. Um, I have some a few simple questions and uh, rather one bigger uh, complex uh, or maybe something difficult to answer. Um, there have been uh, just have seen some discussions recently on um, measuring measuring the uh, fishing efficiency 
of uh, fishing boats. Uh, so I know you talked about gear efficiency, but uh, I'm just curious about fishing efficiency. So what I mean by that, if you are not aware, um, um, there have been some metrics um, calculated based on uh, how much money is going in, how much money is getting out from it, from a fishing, you know. Uh, so, and given that there's a fishery and uh, number of boats going in there, and this also depends on, you know, how much um, engine power or, you know, all other stuff. So the, basically how much money you throw in and uh, how much money is you getting back. You definitely talked about revenue, but how about the profit? Uh, the metrics I've seen have split the, um, the expense between fixed assets and the variables. So variables can be a running cost, which can change very dynamic, but the fixed cost is something you can use because it can be stable uh, or consistent for a longer period. And uh, I'm just wondering whether all these um, technological measures like BRD or other, other trials we've been talking about, have you measured this in, in the context of fishing efficiency or, uh, you know, so, or, I mean, you, you can you can keep going, spending more and more on uh, technology and, um, but then the, when you measure it against the returns, uh, whether these trials or new technological measures are making a difference or to the profit or whatever, I hope you understand my question. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, if I got it right, uh, is that, are you asking, uh, you found, I mean, uh, this is what I get. In fact, I think, is it a work by Sumaila from the... Um, oh, I think one of the papers, yeah. may, maybe, uh, but there, yeah. there have been a few papers from the Australia. You be, okay, uh, okay. But you get this from the economics context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious, you know, you talk, definitely talked about, uh, you know, revenue there, uh, you know, uh, using these uh, different by, by cash production devices, the revenue, but then have you measured with the, you know, net returns from it? No, no. Uh, in fact, uh, these studies, what I mentioned was not with regard to net returns, it was just the operational cost. So one study which we have conducted of uh, Sanjudur Coast was specifically for a particular haul. What is the total, uh, you know, cash they get, and in terms of escapement, what is the loss happening, and what's the percentage loss that's happening, and uh, what we have done is uh, we have calculated that, and then uh, we have also calculated the diesel reduction that's happening when uh, the square mesh cordons are used. So uh, in fact, what we have found uh, was that whatever uh, escape and happens. I think it was 2.5 kilograms per hour or so, mostly juveniles. So normally they sell it for 20 rupees or so. So as as you were mentioning, like uh, it's not about the you know uh, the fixed cost and all, but just the operational cost. What we have mentioned, and definitely, uh, yeah. Uh, I know the the point of view you talked is from the maybe from the you know stock, stock yeah. fish stock sustainability and everything. Yeah. But whether it is sustainable in terms of fishing from a fisherman's point of view. Yeah. Uh, would they, whether these devices are making any difference to their, whether they, I mean, that, that links to whether they want to adopt such technology, you know, so it's, before, for them is, is more about that, you know, how much, whether they are getting any benefit out of doing this. Yeah, but then we have not extended it to the stock level or anything of that sort. It was just a demonstration. And I think we have uh, uh, planning for that, in fact. Uh, so we have a database, uh, maybe a time series of maybe some 12 or 13 years, and then we are planning for that type of work. So how could how, how that would have affected, in fact, the long-term um, yeah. stocks and all? Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but, uh, yeah I agree. Uh, but there's some, some line of uh, work, maybe we can extend whatever we're doing here. Um, my, I think I have, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. 
sorry yeah i have already talked with uh, one economist uh, i think ganesh i think he has already was a uh, speaker here i think ganesh oh yeah yeah i mean think, yeah. think yeah we really had a discussion sometime back and it was specifically regarding this yeah so that was one of the uh, the questions i had that i was saying may be difficult to answer uh, the other simple ones and i just uh, i'm not aware about it uh, when you said discard i mean the bycatch re- this retained bycatch and discarded bycatch the one going to fish meals are discarded ones or the retained bycatch they are the retained catch oh ah, okay are- okay yeah. because uh, i yeah i mean i know the literal meaning but you know sometimes they are interchangeably used for, yeah, yeah 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 no but then there is one thing uh, there was a, um, i think it was in 2001 or so where uh, again from the university of british columbia pramod there was a work from pramod which showed that the discards from gujarat were the least and the highest was in kerala it's quite contrasting like what we what, what we see when we go to the field because in gujarat Uh, if you go any vessel will have at least 2 to 3 tons of uh, no bycatch in the deck so you just got get confused like why it is so and the problem is or the issue here is in fact both are correct so what happens here is in kerala uh, what we get as bycatch is mostly uh, I, i was mentioning about the incidental catch what we get is mostly shells the dead shells so they discard it so that goes as discard and but then uh, the actual you know uh, the fish juniors what they get here is quite less when compared to gujarat so gujarat discards is less but <laughs> kerala again discards are high so that's the you know <laughs> mm. so this is the, initially i was mentioning about the confusion in the terms yeah uh, just yeah. in in here northern territory in australia um uh, the re- uh, retained so called bycatch is called by product species and the other one which you actually throw which you discard is called a bycatch <laughs> okay <laughs> just to put that in context um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, so the dead shells in the catch also treated as bycatch uh, discard it's discard yeah discards okay yeah so yeah, they are dead shells so it is discard okay Yes, yeah, called this uh, bycatch here. Discards and bycatch same here. Uh, the different types of meshes you talk like a, a minimum legal size, you know, mesh size of the gear, selective gear, close season. I mean, there are a whole heap of you know meshes like that. But how many of them are actually you know? Uh, I mean, in terms of compliance, um, you know. uh is any uh, in all of them are not obviously being followed i guess but is there someone to actually uh, monitor the, all these things and uh, and just you know i'm just away from india for lots of long maybe <laughs> this may be very simple question but uh, i'm just wondering you know yeah you, you have these things in by law but whether that they are being practiced whether there is compliance and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, whether that really you know is making any difference having this in in paper no but then uh, uh, like i think we already mentioned about that kerala i think it's, they are making progress uh, because uh, there's a lot of you know uh, control and the surveillance that is coming up uh, and uh, they are like you know sub, uh, giving subsidies for uh, the installation of uh, square mesh cordons so they're giving uh, money for that so that fishermen can directly buy it and also there are regular checks in the harbors for the mls so that is again another good thing and of course you know the seasonal ban it's you no know, it's the only thing i think which is followed entire i mean very religiously all along the coast so yeah, of course kerala we have a you know um, what is that mechanized uh, traditional or something what mechanized traditional where, where they can go out for fishing in the monsoons specifically for the bosinas and rinsinas But otherwise like i think these three are you know taken care of and also we have this engine power restrictions uh, 250 hp is the limit for a engine and that is been taken care of because of course there are vessels which are more than that but i think new vessels there is a control uh, because they have to get a license for that so that is also there and apart from that uh, there is one more uh, uh, with regard to the uh, licensing of uh, yards uh, fish i mean the boat building yards i think that is also taken care of so kerala in that term in, in that you know context it's quite you know ahead of other states hmm yeah 
Yeah, I, I was just curious which of them are, I mean, what will be the le uh, the one measure that is least, you know, I mean, implemented or monitored? Least and, implemented and, 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 uh, and what is actually stopping that from being adopted or? I think uh, <laughs> all of these in fact, so even if you say that these things are in place, but then it, there is no 100%, you know, compliance that is there. Yeah. So maybe like if you have 50% uh, um, compliance for some, you, you have some 60% for something else, and then maybe 20% for some, some other technical measure. But, so but there that is, is like how it goes, yeah. There's a monitoring thing in, in place or? Yeah, monitoring is in place. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Also, yeah. 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 And also, uh, I think there is uh, you know, uh, the fishery implement, improvement plan is also like the fisheries department is, is quite proactive here. So mm -hmm. uh, they are also helping with regard to the uh, fisheries improvement plan, the certification schemes and all. I think we, recently we had a meeting with the director of fisheries. So they are also like in quite, you know, uh, quite, you know, uh, helpful in that case. I think it's a collaborative thing along with the industry and then uh, the state department and Fisheries institutions, all those, I mean, all of them are coming together. Yeah. I think Kerala is going into fishing gear registration also, right? Something along those lines. Yeah, it is already there because the gear uh, restrictions is there and I think Goa has already come out with that. Okay. With, uh, legal gears. I think I had talked to a person there. So they have, in fact, come out with that. In fact. Okay. Uh, so they should have only licensed gears. gears. They're going to market. Yeah. 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 Market yeah. and then only those gears should be used. Yeah. There's one the gear uh, mesh, uh, modification you're talking about, the cutting the top belly of the trawl. Um, so is that reducing the drag or, you know, being or giving more efficiency in terms of uh, trawling? Any difference in terms of that? Yeah, that we, we have found around 10 to 12% uh, reduction in the drag, but that was an empirical calculation, but we are not calculated at, in, in the field. So what we have done is like we have removed uh, that part so we have calculations with regard to like what is what is the resistance offered by a particular uh, gear i mean particular uh, mesh of a particular mesh size so with that we have actually calculated so there must be some reduction definitely uh, some sort of uh, fuel efficiency is there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is one more question from Vincent sir what are the requirements for the us embargo to be lifted if you, uh, sir you are online you can directly ask him sir uh, Dr. Madhu, I was thinking of uh, US is coming up with the ban. No? So, what are things we have to address? For yeah, getting... uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the design now is finalized. And along with that, uh, what this specification is like uh, with regard to the aluminium rods. So, the aluminium rods which they have specified, uh, we don't produce here in India. So, that has to be extruded separately. So, we are contacting, uh, so that in fact, Emperor is also closely involved with that. So, we have to extrude that and Jindal is being contacted for that. So, that is one part. Uh, and then uh, what I think they have, the final says of this is that they, we should at least start in one state. And I think that state would be Kerala, where uh, because Kerala is one of the state, states which is uh, highly affected because of this ban because we, we generate a lot of uh, wild uh, shrimp. So what they, uh, I think, uh, based on discussions, what they have agreed, I think, is they should demonstrate uh, uh, this new TED design in one state, and that would be Kerala, and then gradually, uh, you know, uh, take it forward for other states also. Where uh, I think they won't. I mean, uh, they are very much into it, and then it seems like uh, we will have to implement it along along the coast and. And in all the troll, troll nets, I think that is a recent thing. But I think initially it is going to be Kerala where the trials will be conducted. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think there is no more questions now. Uh, I think uh, we have a very uh, productive and uh, interesting uh, discussion section to, after today's talk. Thank you much, uh, much, sir, for giving this talk and also answering the questions very patiently and uh, having a great discussion with the participants. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madhu. I think we can. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sajina. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. You. Uh, thank yeah. you, sir, for your inputs also.